Why had Microsoft apparently included a key from the NSA in Windows, and what was its purpose? Had they been forced or coerced by the government into including a breaking key that could reveal everyone's private data? So, I mean, 20-year-old code that you wrote is still in Windows today. Yeah, the thing that surprises me the most is that if you minimize Task Manager, you get a little tiny draft down by the clock. Blue screen of death. Why is it blue, and is it possible to change the color? Should I learn Rust because everybody else is learning Rust? Or should I learn Go because everybody's learning Go? Or do I just wait until I need that? And it just kind of grew from there as I was building the Task Manager, didn't even know what it was going to be called Task Manager yet. Windows is 99.9% .9 C and C++. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very special guest. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course, Dave. I'm really excited to you know get you on the channel, and I believe you can give us a quick history about yourself for people who haven't seen you. It's something to do with uh, stuff in these boxes, right? I've got a few of them behind me as well. Yeah, back in the days when software came on coasters, my fingerprints were on most of them. Um, I started at Microsoft in MS-DOS, and I worked in MS-DOS for a year doing smart drive and double space and disk copy and a bunch of the utilities set up, things that come with MS-DOS. Then I moved briefly to the COM OLA team, but I jumped really quick to an opportunity to join the NT Shell team at Microsoft, which was to take all of the Win95 user interface from Win95, rewrite, port it for the 32-bit NT operating system. And so we spent a number of years doing that, where we just churned through thousands upon thousands of lines of other people's code, which is actually a really good way to learn a system when you're trying to get your feet wet. That's where we did a lot of the side projects like Task Manager and Visual Zip and Pinball and things like that that people may recognize were generally done in that era as well. And uh, so I worked on that all the way through XP and Server 2003. So everything from MS-DOS to Server 2003, kind of that time period. Dave, I really want to pick your brains about that software. Uh, but I'll, I'll say this, I started my sort of MCSE journey with uh, NT4. So NT4 is a really special place for me. So thanks so much for, you know, all the hard work that you did on that. So let's talk about like NT4 and a task manager, because I think that's this a really special story there. You've got a lot of cool stories. And actually, just before we start with that, uh, just for everyone watching, please go and make sure that you subscribe to Dave's channel. Dave, tell us about your channel and then tell us about Task Manager. Sure. Channel Dave's Garage it focuses really on two bulk topics. One is programming issues and the other one is Microsoft history, particularly the stuff that I was involved in. So there are a number of topics that have generally proven proper, popular, such as uh, why are blue screens blue and who decided yeah, exactly. that they were going to be blue and that kind of thing. And I have a video on Windows Pinball and the evolution and the history of that and how that got brought over to Windows. And of course, we talk about Task Manager and uh, what are the zip folders we have a video on, I believe. And then some more esoteric content like scroll lock. Why is it there? What's it for? What's it do? What's it used for today? Why do computers get slower with age and so on? I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos. I spent most of today watching your videos. Fantastic content. So, if anyone who's interested in the like sort of the history of of Windows and why decisions were made, or just learning programming, highly recommend that you go and subscribe to Dave's channel. One of the big things you're trying to do, Dave, is grow your channel. And I love what you said at the end. You're not trying to sell something. You haven't got Patreons. You're just trying to get subs and likes, right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm in it for. So. so Dave, let's talk about how you started at Microsoft because I there, there's sort of like a theme, if you like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've kind of seen this theme where you write some software and then perhaps on the side and then it opens doors or something happens. <laughs> so Yeah, that's yeah. been a bit of a history for me, yeah. Um, initially, I had put myself through college writing a software package for the Amiga called Hypercache, which was to add OS-level cache into the operating system since the Amiga lacked that. Yeah. And then for the summer, I was working at the telephone company doing a 10 base T swap over of all their network from, I guess they were on UBNet at something at one point. And so it was kind of a grunge grind job, you know, going through swapping network cards and drivers. And one day I went down to the food court to eat uh, my lunch with the old and the board. And I grabbed a book from the bookstore <laughs> called Hard Drive. Uh, Hard Drive, it was the history of make, the making of Microsoft and Bill Gates, I believe. Yep. So I started reading this book, and it was so quantitatively different from the life I was leading, swapping network cards, that the stories of what these people were working on and how fascinating it was, and the fact that billions of people would eventually wind up running it, I knew that's where I wanted to be, but I was in Saskatchewan going to university at the time. So I decided to go through my registration cards for Hypercache, because back in those days, there was no internet yet, or there was no web anyway. And uh, people would fill out these cards with their name and address, and you'd mail them when there was an update to the software. So people mailed these cards in, and a few included their email addresses. 
So I went through and I looked for absolutely anybody I could find with a Microsoft.com email address, and I just cold emailed them saying, hi, I'm a programmer in Saskatchewan, here's what I've done, and I'd love to work for Microsoft. And one guy named Alistair Banks got back to me, and he gave me probably the, the greatest gift you can give to an aspiring graduate, which is the email of a hiring manager with an open position. And that turned out to be Ben Slivka, who did a phone interview with me for MS-DOS, and that's how I wound up in MS-DOS. So it came out and did like the full interview circuit where it's five or six one-hour interviews with a lunch interview in between. It used to be a pretty grueling process. I don't think they do it quite that way anymore. Because you wrote the software on the side, and, and if I remember correctly, you, you actually had a little business going with that software. Did that kind of open the doors for you? Well, it got me the job in the sense that it got me the connection initially. And then when I started at Microsoft, I told them I always have had a hobby of writing software on the side. Yep. And we made allowances so that I could continue doing that as long as it wasn't competitive with Microsoft. And so that became handy as well. Basically, I was always working on something at home because I'd see something interesting in the shell at work and I'd want to tinker with it, but you kind of need an opportunity to do that at work, so I would tinker at home. And one of the things that was very frustrating about Windows NT, at least in 3.1, the very first version, was there was no task manager. There was yeah. a list of running Windows and you could end task on them, but that was really it. So I started thinking around with just, hey, I'll make myself a list of programs and I'll map that to what processes they are and I'll go through and see if I can figure out how to kill a process as they would do under, not Linux at the time, but perhaps Unix. And it just kind of grew from there as I was building the task manager, didn't even know what it was going to be called task manager yet, but I was building it at home and adding the features and functionality that seemed obvious and apparent to me that people would need because I wanted it. Yeah. So I was by and large writing software for myself and then I took it in and I was using it at work uh, on my debugging machine and other developers saw it and said, oh, can I have a copy of that to try it on mine? And it kind of spread around the team until it got to the notice of some of the higher ups like Dave Cutler and he seemed to enjoy it as well. So he gave me the dispensation to just, he said, put it on the top of the start menu. Well, that kind of outraged the Windows 95 designers because they had this design <laughs> aesthetic of simplification and keeping everything out of your face. So sticking it right on top of the start menu was kind of an affront to them. So. I think we moved it down to system tools for the actual NT4 release, and uh, that's where it's lived ever since. So, I mean, you were writing this, if I, if I remember correctly, because you've got a whole video about this. So just for everyone who's watching, if you want to get more detail, go and have a look at Dave's channel. You wrote this like at home as a hobby, and then, then that was actually incorporated into Windows and is basically the task manager we have today, right? Yeah, I got it. Uh, the, the stuff I wrote at home was the real basics, the pages and the layout and stuff like that. And then once I was able to bring it internal, I was able to talk directly to the kernel because when I was linking at home, I was linking with Visual C, whereas once you're part of the operating system, you have a little greater access to some of the internal functions. So it actually simplified my life quite a bit to become an internal project, I think, in that case. And I believe, I mean, let me see if my notes are right. You've got some like interesting names um, in the code still, well, perhaps to today, uh, where it's like Dave's frame window or Dave's controls, stuff like that, right? Yeah, there are some Windows controls that actually don't paint without flicker. So, for example, a group box erases its center and then redraws its contents. And that makes it flicker. So I didn't want that. So I came up with Dave's group box when I was still working. <laughs> Very <at home>. original, right? <laughs> yeah. I just stuck my name in front of the real name and gave it my custom behavior and functionality. But that has stuck, apparently, because it's one of those things. It's never a good time to go in and change. And there was another example where there was a process called kill process. And that was the one that would go through and actually end the process in the kernel. And Jim Alchin wanted to make that recursive. So you could say end process tree and it would kill your process and everything all the way down. So naturally the programmer that was working on this work item just went through and replaced process with all children. And so for years in the source code, we had the kill all children function. Oh, I just gonna say it's a rather unfortunately <laughs> named function, but. But I mean, that's not visible to me as a user, right? It's all in the source code. Yeah, perhaps if you had a full internal debug build, it would show up in maybe the symbol table, but I'm pretty sure it makes it uh, doesn't make it past the sanitizing action of the compiler for the public retail builds anyway. I remember in the old days with uh, Task Manager, I mean, I started with Windows, well, DOS uh, and Windows 3.1 was the first win version of Windows that I uh, like had in production. Um, you mentioned something, and I, I kind of, when you, when you said in your video, I remembered this, where you could elevate the privileges of a process, right? Or, and you could kill any process with Task Manager, but they've kind of like limited that these days. Is that right? 
A little bit. So initially, we allowed you to kill absolutely anything, including the win logon process, which would instantly terminate your session and tear down the machine, because you do technically have the rights to do that if you're an administrator, where if something is running in another user's session entirely, because NT is a multi-session, multi-headed workstation, normally they don't allow you to kill things in other people's session, but Task Manager knows it could if you wanted to, so it just goes ahead and does it for you. So you're limited only by the security and the ACLs and everything you have on your account. And we found that journalists were having a great time killing win logon or bug checking the system by killing important pieces of the system and saying, well, look how unstable the system is. But I mean, you can kill negative nine, the wrong thing on Linux too, and get the same results. So it's one of those don't do that things. And yeah, it's interesting because when I watch some of your videos, you, you also had a piece and I don't want to get into like the, the flaming wars, but like uh, Linux versus Windows. And I mean, you said something along the lines that you go immediately into DOS prompt or like PowerShell or something in Windows. It's not like you're just a Windows guy, you, you know, multiple operating systems. Yeah, I do most of my development under Linux on WSL2 on Windows. And then I spend the other half of my day probably because I have the YouTube channel on a Mac in Final Cut and so on. So I, I, I actually mix my day almost one third, I would say, between the three systems. So each one has, you know, what they're really good at. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, I always find it hilarious when guys like try and like, this is the best operating system on earth. It's like, it just depends on the use case I find because I use Windows, I use Linux and I use Mac. Right. So are you coding for like, is this just your, like your own projects again? Or when you're coding in Windows, obviously you, you wouldn't be coding on Linux or is that what you were doing in, back in the day? Actually, everything I've written in the last five years is fully compatible that it will run on Windows, Mac or Linux. And that's just been a case of even if we're writing in C-sharp, we use the mono framework so that it will, again, run on the Mac and Linux. So I've tried to keep all of my code on GitHub building for all three systems equally. So going back to like when you started, did you code as a child or did was that that project that you mentioned that got you the, the sort of opened the doors at Microsoft? Was that the first coding that you did really or how did you get into it? I was born in 68, so I was around 10 in 1978 to 80 in that window there, and I happened to walk into a Radio Shack store, and they had a box, uh, the TRS-80 Model 1, Level 1, 4K, the very first one that came out from Radio Shack. And it said computer on the side, and I was pretty fascinated by that. So I asked them, can I use it? And they said, well, it's not set up yet. I said, well, can I set it up for you? And they kind of laughed at me and said, sure, kid, have a shot. And in reality, it's not much different than setting up a component stereo. You know, it's just cables from one to the other, except Tandy and their infinite wisdom back in the day used the same five pin DIN connector for power, video and keyboard. So you had many chances to blow it up, but I managed not to. So once I had it up and running, they were pretty impressed by that. And they allowed me to ride my pedal bike down there every Thursday night for nighttime shopping. And I'd spend several hours on Thursday and sometimes on Saturday um, tinkering away on the TRS-80 Model 1. And I knew absolutely nothing about it. I thought it was a computer. So I was typing English sentences in and getting SN errors, which I thought were spelling, but were, of course, syntax. I just didn't know what syntax was yet. But within a week or two, I figured out that there was a set of commands in BASIC that you could use to build BASIC apps. And so I started coding in BASIC around 10, I would guess, 10 to 12, somewhere in there. And then by the time I was 15 or 16, I had tinkered a bit with machine language on the Commodore 64, and I moved pretty much to everything in assembly at that point. Oh, so in those days, you were programming in assembly? Yeah, largely. Well, the first thing I did was a machine language monitor. It didn't have an assembler, so it was literal hex codes. And if you wanted to insert code, you had to jump out, execute, jump back. It was just horrible spaghetti nonsense. But it was a good way to learn the lower levels of the machine. So, I mean, what's your advice to people today or young people who want to get into coding? Is there any like or development? Let's say, let's say their dream is to work for a company like Microsoft. Do you have any recommendations of things to do, programming languages? You've done the, you've been down this road many, many years of experience. What, you know, what's your advice to younger people or someone who wants to start out? Yeah, my recipe today is different than it would be 20 years ago. I think today yeah. I would focus on being really proficient in Python, not because you're going to write products in Python, but it's just such a functional tool for what developers do all day long that I think knowing it and being proficient in it is pretty much essential. And then from there, you want to be writing in a language like C++ or even C Sharp. I suppose Java, depending on the industry you want to get into, but those will be the big three. And once you've developed proficiency in those, I think if I'm a hiring manager and you're talking to me, my first question is going to be, well, do you have any code on GitHub that I can go and look at? So I think contributing to open source projects and biting off big chunks and doing important pieces of multiple different projects goes a long way to show both your ability and your flexibility. Yeah, so in other words, it's important to show your work, right? And put it on GitHub. Yeah, that's something. Now, I have autism, and that's something that I coach people that have Asperger's and autism to do which is to sell their work and not themselves, because they may not shine at the personality level in an interview, regardless of how technical and brilliant they may be. So 
for some folks, and myself included, I think it's easier to focus on what can I actually do for you as opposed to how wonderful of a person am I? Not that they're not wonderful people. It just doesn't come across all the time. I just wanted to say, I mean, at the end of the day, when you have someone writing code, you're not there. You've been in the games. You correct me if I'm wrong. But I mean, if you want someone to, to write good code, that's their job. It's they, Their job is not to be like a, like a salesperson. It's a different type of role, different kind of skill set, right? Yeah, it very much is. I was somebody who remained an individual contributor for as long as I could because I got in it because I love code and I love coding. I didn't yeah. grow up saying, oh, I wish I could go to a lot of meetings. So it didn't really push that hard in my career for that. There's sort of an inexorable draw towards management as you go through any career, I think. And the bar is probably a little lower when you're managing people than trying to just survive by your own technical merits. So it's an easier path for some folks. But uh, I always wanted to code. And so I still code most of the day today, even though I've been retired for 20 years. I'm still sitting in my shop and studio here coding in C++ because it's what I love to do. So. Yeah, I mean, you said it offline. We didn't record that. You f- you f- you finished at Microsoft 2003 timeframe, right? Right. I was there until 03 was when I left. But you're still coding to tool today. In other words, you've got this love from for coding since a young age and you haven't stopped. Yeah, after I retired, I spent a couple of years doing 3D graphics and learning everything that I, you know, starting kind of where I left off in college and then building with DirectX and Direct12 through some fairly complicated graphics just to get my feet wet and to understand that because it's an important area. And I've done a bunch of database work and I've done a bunch of work in areas that I'm not super comfortable in in order to expand my skill set. I mean, what I love about your story, and I mean, I want to talk about the Zip thing. So let's talk about Zip, and then I'll come back to like the career stuff, because sure. what you've said about showing your work, I mean, that's opened so many doors for you and brought you, uh, I don't want to give it away, red things. Let's leave it at that. So let's talk about the Zip episode, if you like. Yeah, it's the perfect case where there's absolutely no personality and only code involved, because I, that's something I had written at home and was selling as a shareware product. And just for some backstory, before that, you would use command line tools to unpack a Zip, and then WinZip would come out a couple of years around the same time, maybe a couple of years later, but we're looking for a way, or I was looking for a way to learn the new shell API, which allows you to host uh, different things within a shell folder, such as you can have control panel applets yeah. or files or different things to be hosted in it. So I thought, what if I was to take a zip file, parse the internal structure, and then expose that as a folder hierarchy that you could just browse through and grab the file you wanted. It seemed to fit in really well with the new shell paradigm. So I went about writing that and then got it finished and it was called Visual Zip. I was selling it as shareware and I was selling maybe a dozen copies of day, something like that at the time. And I was leaving for work one morning and I got a call from a lady at Microsoft. She said, are you the, are you Dave Plummer? And I said, yes. And she said, did you write Visual Zip? And I said, yes. Or she probably called it. Yeah, she did call it Visual Zip. Um, and I said, yeah. She said, well, we'd like to talk to you about an acquisition and buying it to include in Windows. And we will, you know, have you come in and talk about it. And I was like, great. What building are you in? I'll be right over. She's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, you got to talk to Microsoft legal and travel and all this. And I'm like totally confused because why well, I already worked there. Why would I have to go to see the legal department to come to your building? And that's when we figured out neither one of us knew that she didn't know that I didn't or that I worked at Microsoft already. And she had just cold called the author of this piece of software to see who owned it and it turned out to be me. So uh, once it's your own company that you're negotiating with and you've got a stipulation clause that you can't compete with them anyway, you're kind of stuck in a bad position where you take whatever offer you get. And that's kind of what I did. So I took their first only and best offer and I bought a uh, used 94 Corvette at the time with it. So I had that for a long time and that was my visuals at Mobile. But I mean, the story is from what I've, you know, sort of the thread through your story is you love coding uh, and development. You, you wrote the stuff on the side and a lot of the tools that we use today exists because you did this on the side and it opened doors for you. Yeah, it sure did open doors for me. That's certainly true. The fact or to the extent that other people find the stuff I've written for myself useful, I mean, I love that. But it wasn't necessarily an attempt to write something that everybody would find useful so much as write something that I really think would be useful. And then luckily, other people find it so as well. But let's go back to like the advice to young people, people who are starting out. It's like you said, like show your work. And I mean, I, you and I both on YouTube, if you're looking for for a video editor, I don't care what your personality is. It's like, can you edit? Right. I think you to show me your work. is It's the same kind of thing. If, you, if you're putting your work on GitHub or you, you're making your products like you did and selling it, that just opens doors rather than like trying to make a speech or something, especially if you struggle to talk. Right. Yeah, I think uh, being able to demonstrate your technical ability in that market is really important. And you can only get so much across. Even on a whiteboard interview, you can do pretty well in a whiteboard interview, but many companies don't do those anymore. They just sit and talk for 45 minutes and you're supposed to convince them that you understand why a C++ class with a virtual function needs a virtual destructor. And it doesn't come across in that kind of environment, I don't think. So if that's what you're good at, you're gonna have to find some way to get that across. 
and your work is probably the best way. So, I mean, another criticism a lot, a lot of young people have is like, it was easier in the old days than it is today. And then all the old timers say, well, it's so much easier today. What are your thoughts? You know, if, if, I, if I was starting out today, is it easier to, to get into this now? I mean, it sounds like in the old days you had to do assembly and all low level stuff. It sounds like the past a lot easier today with Python. Yeah, I think it's a different landscape. So back in my day, the landscape was much smaller. No one person could understand yep. all of NT, but you could understand the storage manager or the heat manager or the shell and know that piece really, really well. Whereas today, the system is so big and so wide, the landscape of what is involved in a PC, that you can't know everything about it. So you almost have to specialize. I think in my day, I specialized in operating systems because that was where my fascination was. But other people may find other niches to be active in. And the big thing, I think, is that you achieve mastery in at least something as opposed to being a dilettante and being good at 100 things. Be good at least one thing for sure, I guess. That's great advice. I mean, become an expert in, in, in like you were in, in operating systems. Don't try and like do web programming and Windows programming, like focus on something, right? Right. That's a question I often have for other people that are in my position uh, is at what point do you decide to learn something? Should I learn Rust because everybody else is learning Rust? Or should I learn Go because everybody's learning Go? Or do I just wait until I need that? And I never know. And, you know, if it's been around several years, yeah, I'll go learn Rust because it's been out five, eight, you know, a number of years now. But I'm not one of those jump on the immediate coattails of the coolest thing because so many things have come and gone in the last 20 years. That yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I had it on my list here because you mentioned Python, C Sharp, C++, maybe Java, but you didn't mention Rust and you didn't mention Golang. Like your list still the same or would you say have a look at Rust today? I would definitely look at learning Rust today, uh, especially if I was just starting out. My thought on Rust is that it's great and it provides you a great level of safety and security that you can also achieve in C++ by not doing doing silly things. Um, if you don't try to manage your own memory and strings and all the other things that are so air prone in C++ and you use the new C17, 14, 20 versions of the language facilities, you can avoid stabbing yourself the way that you used to. And so Rust, Rust is one way to solve that problem, but it's not the only way. And should I learn C? I think so. I, th I think you have, I think everybody needs to learn C at some point. And, but not use it in production, you know, just, just use it to learn or and then go and go and use Rust. I think the thing is that you will run into it in your career because C is so ubiquitous in the industry that if you get to a chunk of code and you can't read it, it's going to look rather odd. So you should at least be very familiar with C, even if you don't write production code in it daily or anything. How much of Windows is written in, is, is it C? Uh, or what languages is Windows written in? C or uh, Windows is 99.9% .9 C and C++. And in my day, it was probably 50-50 split between C and C++ with more stuff migrating to C++. In fact, in the shell, the shell code is actually kind of fascinating because it's C++ and it uses COM and OLA, but it is not C++ and it doesn't use COM or OLA directly, which is to say they manually set up their own vtables on classes and invoke through the jump table because they don't want to load COM DLL and they don't want to load OLA32 DLL and they don't want to load all these other dependent DLLs. So they wound up recreating a lot of the infrastructure in the shell to just never have to load any external code. And I think that we removed a lot of that in NT because I think a lot of that came from the four megabyte ma minimum working set of Windows 95. Um, they had to do a lot of tricks to run in four megs. So. Yeah, I want to talk about the difference between 95 and NT because I mean, that was a huge shift. But just before we get there, we're talking about languages. You did a speed test of various, I think it was a hundred languages. And I think it was a new language that I'd never heard of, Zig or something that yeah. came, that was like top, top of the list. Is is that right? Yeah, a number of years ago, actually, about two years ago, I wrote a prime sieve, and then I thought, well, I'm going to write this in C++, and I'll write it in C Sharp, and I'll write it in Python, and I'll write the exact same algorithm in all three different languages, and then we'll drag race them and see how it turns out. So there's an episode on that, and spoiler alert, Python does not win. Um, the C++ one did the best, but that's probably because that's where I'm most proficient. So I thought, well, what if I put this up on GitHub, and I allow other people to contribute their code and solutions to it? And pretty soon it started to run away and I had to find people to help manage the GitHub projects. And I've got Rutger in the Netherlands who does that for me now. And he's been essential because there are 100 languages with a couple hundred different solutions or implementations. And I got to confess that half of these languages I'd never heard of. So if you know 50 languages, they're not known for that. If you've heard of 50 languages, you're doing pretty well. The other 50 were all uh, new to me, I would say, or if not half, many of them. So we 
did all 100 and we have an automated system that every day goes through and builds every solution, builds a Docker container for each one, tests the solution and ranks it, scores it, puts it in a database. And so we've had pretty good handle on the performance trends for a while and Rust and Zig both overtook C++ in recent months. And I believe Go is right up there as well. But uh, Zig is definitely, for some reason, the fastest. And I've looked at it a bit. I can tell that the language seems to provide some level of facility for multi-threading within it, as opposed to making the programmer do everything manually like you do in C++ largely. So I think that's given them a leg up, but I haven't decided if the compiler itself is smarter or what's causing it, but the numbers don't lie. So for now, Zig is the fastest. But I think Rust was two, is that right? I think Rust is number two, and then C++ was three. YouTube's an inter interesting place. I mean, you know this, because uh, you, you've got a huge channel uh, and you get a crazy amount of views, which is fantastic to see. People will like say bad things about Python. I mean, you mentioned Python didn't come first because it's a slow language. Would you say, if I'm starting out, learn Python and focus on getting good at that rather than trying to get like the most efficient code? I mean, you can you can use the more efficient languages later. Yeah, I think that premature optimization is one of the great evils of software. Uh, people tend to try to make things fast before they make them right, then it gets just worse and worse and worse. So I wouldn't write anything that was super performance sensitive in Python, but the last Python script I wrote was to be able to grab a YouTube video, take the frames as they come off, scale them down to 60 four by 32, Wi-Fi them over to a matrix and draw them on a display. And it was less than a page of code and it ran at full 60 frames a second. So what more do you really want to ask of a language? If you need more speed like C++, let's hope you're doing some very fine grained things that are called an awful lot because for most things, Python will get you 95% of the way there, I think. I'm glad you said that. I mean, if you're writing kernel level stuff like you were, um, operating level stuff, that's a totally different ball game. But for most of us, you know, we, we're starting with applications. Like that was a use case that you found really useful for Python. So I think I always recommend start with Python. And I'm glad to hear you saying the same thing. Yeah, the number of cases where you need to be in there counting actual machine cycle or machine cycles like we're used to is pretty uncommon. If you're writing, again, the heat manager or a thread schedule or something like that, that is called millions of times per second, then it's essential. But if you're writing a piece of code that's going to be called once and you just need the results, it's probably fast enough. Yeah, so I mean, you need to focus on writing your code right rather than trying to get it optimized. Because I mean, if you write it badly, it doesn't matter how good the optimization is, right? Yeah, so a lot of that comes from doing it right the first time, which you can't do because programmers generally write a really terrible version for the first version because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they don't know yet. And then they come along and they write the second version where they have a dangerous level of knowledge where they make it super complicated and over-engineer it. And then they come back the third time and they write it like they should have the first time. But it usually takes three iterations to get something really well done, I think. So let's talk, let's switch to like 95 versus NT. I mean, that, that was a massive change. So can you give us a bit of like insider stories? Uh, just for everyone who's watching, Dave's got a whole bunch of these insider stories and we've kind of like spoken about a few, about a few of them. But tell us a bit about the stories of like 95 versus NT and how it changed. So in late 94, 95, before, this is before when 95 had shipped, there was an effort amongst some rebels at Microsoft to take the Windows 95 code and put it on NT. And the reason that was rebellious is that NT already had a user interface planned for Cairo. And it was completely different. It had folder hangers and it had some features that Windows 95 didn't and it lacked. It was just different. Cairo is a long way away. So at some point, somebody made up t-shirts for Microsoft Tukwila, which for context is probably 30 miles from here. The, the joke being, we know where it is and we can get there from here. And so that became the internal code name. And the push was to take all of the code that gave you the user experience on Win95 and adapted for NT. Now, some of that is really easy because it's both the Win32 API, so a lot of the code just translates directly. The problem, the biggest problem is that Windows NT is fully Unicode, so it has to support the Asian character sets and Middle East and right-to-left reading and everything in the base system. So that means 16-bit characters, and when you're a programmer, if you've been writing in C, you've probably been assuming for your entire life that a character is one byte, and all of a sudden, it's not. And so every line of code that ever made that assumption or that a buffer's length is equal to the number of characters times one for the number of bytes, that's also wrong. Size ofs are also wrong. So there's just a ton of code is all of a sudden wrong. You can catch a certain amount of that with automated tools, but bulk of it was going through line by line and reading every piece of code and seeing what it was doing and where the assumptions were wrong and broken. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a great way to learn code because you're going to look at every line of the system by the time you're done. And it probably took us a solid year to get it to the point where it was running well in Unicode. There was an initial boot where we did it in ANSI, but had everything working on NT. But of course, we can't ship that because it's English only and NT is an international system. But it was sort of the first foothold getting it working in English. The uh, compatibility was really tough because imagine on disk, you have a shortcut file from Win95. It's got all this information packed in there about the path and all that, but it's ANSI. 
fancy. So when Windows NT is given one of these, it can parse it using the official format. But when it goes to, if you rename the file and then throw a kanji character in the middle of the name, what's it going to do with it? And it winds yeah. up having to store everything in a way that is invisible to Windows 95, but present for Windows NT systems. And yet Windows 95 will preserve and take that information, pay a little around with it. So it gets fairly complicated to do this in a way that's totally backwards compatible with almost no help from the backwards compatible system because they were not, you know, they were on a death march to get this thing out the door. They weren't going to make a bunch of changes to make our lives easier. So they just shipped what they shipped to get it working for Win95, and we had to adapt it from there. I mean, in today's world, we've got Windows 11 um, at the time of this recording. A lot of what you and the team developed in those days either is part of Windows 11 today, or is, it's like an iteration of that. Is, is that fair to say? I mean, the original uh, history is from NT. Yeah, I would bet that 80 to 90% of the shell code that we wrote for NT4 is still in there. And they've built on top of that, of course, to add new features and functionality, but plumbing is all the same underneath. So, And how many years ago is that? 20 at this point. So, I mean, 20-year-old code that you wrote is still in Windows today. Yeah, the thing that surprises me the most is that if you minimize Task Manager, you get a little tiny draft down by the clock, and it's 10 frames, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on up to 100. And I drew those in the Visual Studio 2.0 resource editor in 1993, and they're identical and they haven't changed. So it's the last vestige of any, well, I guess, except for the format dialogue, it's the last UI that I wrote or that I designed, quote unquote designed, that's still in the system. So That's mad. And I mean, Task Manager is, is still similar, very similar to what you yeah. did all those years ago. Yeah, the code is largely the same and they've added a new page uh, for the GPU and sort of that sort of type of thing where they add functionality, but the basic thing is still there and it's just built on top of. So I'm rather fortunate to have code in there that's tw over 20 years old. They haven't thrown away and started again yet, it seems. So. But I mean, it just shows you how good the system was. I mean, the, I'm assuming there was a lot of politics in those days between the Windows 95 team and the NT team. There was. I was kind of isolated from that because I was just an angry code monkey just writing code and um, <laughs> fortunately insulated from most of the back and forth politics. But you can imagine that we're taking their code and we're saying, oh, this is nonsense. Look at all these assumptions you made and we got to fix it and make it right. And then we'll check it into our tree and we'll give it back to you when we're done so you can use it. That message may not come across if it's not delivered carefully. <laughs> so Dave, I mean, I love hearing stories, um, especially, you know, this stuff still affects so many of us today. Have you got any other cool and interesting stories or just like outrageous stories that you can share? Well, there's one that I wasn't going to share, but somebody else shared it for me a couple of years ago. And that is, I did Windows product activation. It was the last thing I worked on. It was my last major project. So that's when you enter your CD key and it does the backend connection and the hardware ID and does all the enforcement. And we really did try to make it as nice and pleasant for the user as possible. But there's a case where you have an OEM key. And this key is intended to say only work on a Dell Latitude from 1997. And so what you do is you encode a digital signature for those strings in the system BIOS where they appear. But for that payload to be small, if it were only a few bytes, you could upload that to Usenet and other people could download it at the time and they would a hole through activation. So to make it hard to do that, I made the file, I think it was 10 megabytes, which in those days took a long time. It took like 10 hours to download 10 megabytes over a modem. So um, I figured that would slow people enough that it would uh, be a hurdle to piracy. And it's a 650 meg CD, so it's not really taking up any room on the CD because we had lots of spare at that time. But what to put in the file? I wanted to make sure that it was non-compressible, so you couldn't just archive it and transmit it easily. And I wanted to make sure it was nonsense and encrypted. So I started with a set of disk images that I found on our product server, which happened to be Microsoft Bob. So I took the six or seven or eight floppies, whatever it is for Bob, and I packed them all together and I encrypted them with a couple different formats. I think TrueCrypt was popular, popular at the time and we used uh, the internal encryption as well. And finally wound up with this 10 megabytes of goo and it has shipped on every CD of every Microsoft XP and some of the subsequent operating systems as this payload that follows around activation keys and nobody knew that it was actually Microsoft Bob. Except when I was leaving the company, I figured I got to tell one person because if they ever have to fix this or undo it, there's got to be somebody who's got to know this. So I told Raymond Chen and uh, I saw a blog post a couple of years from him about it. So that secret's out of the bag. But uh, I probably shipped a lot more copies of Bob than they ever did, I would imagine. That's funny. I mean, I just like looking at this from the outside, you must be loved for Task Manager and you must be hated for Windows activation. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, even my mom doesn't like like activation and she's my mom so what are you gonna do <laughs> but uh the, we really did try to make it as flexible as possible particularly in things like the hardware id so if you go and get a new gpu and you put that in your system you're not suddenly inactivated we look at it and we say well 
same amount of RAM, same CPU, same amount of hard disk space, same number of drives. It's probably the same machine. So there's a lot of cases where the system says it's probably all right. Or if you go to activate it the third time and it's only been two years, it's probably all right. So they build a lot of leniency into the system. We tried to make it so that all the policy would be effective on the back end. So the system was always fully secure and locked down, but the back end could be as gracious as it wanted down to the level of just saying activate everybody for free if they ever had to. So we gave them the flexibility. I think the really painful part of activation was if you had to phone it in, read your CD key into a automated voice system or punch it in with a T9. I think that experience was terrible. But fortunately, very few people are in that boat where they have a completely disconnected system that they can't get any kind of connectivity to. So hopefully that painful case is sufficiently rare. Yeah, I mean, it's. I understand why you had to do it. You've, you've made a video on your channel where you talk about open source. And I mean, I'll just throw this in as, as like a, like something hopefully won't make too many people upset, but you said something along the lines that open source like Linux has closed parts to it. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yeah, I took a lot of heat for that one. There was some pretty tense. I can imagine, yeah. I can imagine. Pretty angry Reddit threads. <laughs> My point was that in a system like Linux, even if 99% of it is open source and readable, if the system ships with closed binaries that run in ring zero and you don't know what those do, or if they run on a driver or they run in a chip and an expansion card and you're just given an opaque driver for it, well, it doesn't matter how much code there is that's closed. If there's any code that's closed that runs privileged, then it's not a fully open source system. Now, the one thing I didn't say is that there are fully open source versions of Linux. I think Mint is one. And if you're careful, but unfortunately, those aren't the distribution that people actually run. They run Ubuntu and it comes down with opaque driver sets. And it was really more a philosophical argument than any assertion that I thought there was anything nefarious in the closed drivers. But from a philosophical perspective, they're both closed systems to an extent. So. And I mean, it's only in the recent day, well, it's only like, I think it was last week, Red Hat changed things. So, I mean, there's a whole blow up about Red Hat anyway at the right. moment. Something you also said, which I... Uh, Maybe people don't like it, but people assume because it's open source, all the code's going to be looked at. But you made this point, which I thought was really interesting, that just because the code is open source doesn't mean that someone with the expertise is going to look at all the code, right. right? Yeah, having a million people look at your heap manager is not as good as having four people that are really qualified to be writing heap managers. So it's really about who's looking at your code, who's writing it, who's fixing it, who's debugging it, and who's being diligent about it. And that can vary entirely by process. And I, I don't mean to imply that Linux is anything but well-managed and well-engineered, but it's not a guarantee just because it's open source, because it's the eyeballs that are looking at the code that are important and not the number of them. I mean, just recently, it's uh, again in the last few days, there's this uh, huge vulnerabilities in Linux. So just because it's open source doesn't mean it's not going to have vulnerabilities and be able to be hacked for that reason that you mentioned and other reasons. Yeah, vulnerabilities do come up and you can ask the question, well, everybody saw this code. There were millions of people looking at this code and nobody saw it. So that's kind of the example of why it's not a guarantee by any stretch. So let's talk about security because a lot of people who watch my channel are into security and cyber. Um, there was, you did this interesting video about the NSA. There was some like code or, or like key in the in Windows that was called NSA something. And then a lot of people assumed that the NSA had um, backdoor access to right. Windows. Long story short, no, the NSA did not give Microsoft a backdoor key to bake into Windows. And I've seen the code and it's all right. I'll tell them, I'll tell them. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well it's done. really unfortunately named. It's the fact that you've got a GUID inside the code base called the NSA key that you have to explain away in later years. And that's really the <laughs> jackpot there. It's not that it's doing anything. Everybody, I'm, I'm sure... In, uh, educational institutions have access to the NT code and there are other groups that have access to the NT code. So if there were a back door and it were that transparent, it would be obvious and well known at this point. So it's Dave, have you, have you got any examples of where someone snuck something into the windows code or did something perhaps nefarious or as a joke? Yeah, I, I don't know of any examples of that. I do know of one example in MS-DOS where an intern put a uh, secret message in MS-DOS, but that's the only, and it was caught before it got in. So I've never seen any nefarious code get snuck into it, and everything is pretty well scrutinized by the time it gets into the main source tree. Not that it's impossible, it's just that it's never happened to my knowledge, and it wasn't something that I think a lot of people thought about. So you can put your initials maybe in something. I've, I've seen that kind of level of vanity when it comes to operating systems and I've done that myself, 
where you need to come up with a signature. Well, DP works as well as 0744, so why not? Um, but in terms of nefarious code, no, I've never seen anything really. For years, Windows has had these Easter eggs, right? So could you explain what an Easter egg is and give us an example where I think your name is in one of the Easter eggs? Yeah, it's eggs. in a couple. Um, Easter egg is basically a code feature left in that traditionally displays the names of the programmers and engineers and people that contributed to the operating system. They go back, I believe, well, back to the 60s if you look hard enough, but in modern software, the game Adventure from Activision, I believe. There was a secret room that you could run into and if you put your guy over a particular pixel, a message would pop up telling you who the original programmer was. And so that's one of the very first Easter eggs. The ones that are in Windows are generally there with wide knowledge and by the time they make it to the operating system, implicit consent from the, op from the management that it's okay. So there's no secret Easter eggs. But they are generally hidden, and the, the real requirements for an Easter egg are, look, it can't slow down the system, it can't take up RAM, it can't take up disk space and to any ma measurable extent. So you have to encode your vanity well, I guess, because they don't want something. There was an example, and I don't want to slam on it because it's not my team, but I think Excel shipped with like an entire Doom game inside of it, where if you did something. I was just thinking about that. There was, a, I remember there was a game in, in one of the products. I can't remember which and one. And as far as I know, Sorry, I think you had to use the CD to load it so that it wasn't taking up your hard disk working space, but uh, it got a bad rep for being a large thing within the app. And everybody's like, well, Excel's yeah. got Doom built in. No wonder Excel's so big. The only case I've seen where anything untoward was put in was an intern when I was working in 93, he was actually in my office and they called me later and asked what I knew about it, which was fortunately nothing. But um, an intern had added a command switch to the copy command in MS-DOS that would display a message about uh, I heart and then sex. And if you entered in the right command, you could get it to generate this over and over and over. So I guess he thought it was clever and funny, but they caught it long before it actually got into the actual source tree. So because everything goes through several layers of scrutiny before it's built into the main product. So. One cool other project you worked on was Pinball, right? You got Pinball into Windows. There was a reason for doing that. And perhaps you can talk about, you know, the Pinball uh, development that sure. you worked on. Um, Pinball was a product that was actually developed by a company called Cinematronics, I believe, and later acquired by Maxis. And then it was licensed by Microsoft to put in the Plus Pack. But of course, that only ran on Win95. There was an effort in NT to try to show them, hey, we're cool too, we can run games. And so the vice president decided, well, we got to have something flashy in the box and Solitaire is just not cutting it for me. So what about that pinball game they ship in the Plus Pack? So my manager came to my office and said, hey, how do you feel about working on pinball for a few months? And it had been a long time since I worked on a game. So I was actually kind of stoked about it. Problem with it is a lot of it was still an x86 assembly language and I still needed it to run on MIPS, Alpha, PowerPC, and the Intel box. So anything that was written in assembly was an entire rewrite. But I was able to save all the game logic and the art and the assets and the game design and get those translated over to work on NT. There was another issue in that I think Win95 had early DirectX support and we were stuck with WinG or create dib section. The drawing mechanism was different. So I wrote a wrapper layer that would in intercept the pinball calls and then draw them using NT's facilities. And it all worked pretty well. So the game wound up shipping in Windows NT4, I believe was the first time we shipped it, and then it shipped all the way through XP. The problem came for them when they added 64-bit support. For some reason, on one of the systems, and I think it might have been the Alpha or the IA64, I'm not sure which, but the ball would go through the paddle, only on 64 bits and only on this one architecture. If it were all 32-bit or all 64-bit architectures, it's probably an easy bug to find, but when it only happens on one CPU, uh, it proved pretty challenging. So they were working on it for a long time, Time. We got brought in all these other sets of eyeballs trying to figure out what was going on and Ray couldn't get a solution in time and he had about 50 other things that he had to port to. So just the reality of the schedule was there's not going to be time to make pinball work on all platforms. And the thing about Microsoft and the way they ship Windows is it pretty much has to work on all platforms or you can't ship it. So I can't put an Intel pinball game in the Alpha or the MIPS box and say run it in the emulator. We didn't have time to port it for you. So because they never take that approach, the code has to work everywhere or nowhere and it didn't work everywhere. So it came out for whatever release that was where they finally pulled it this I mean, Dave, it must be amazing that you've written this stuff such a, so many years ago and it's still being used today. I mean, what, what, what's that feeling like to see it still out there? Well, it's, it's really fortunate that I had the opportunity to work on things that people know very well. It's even more fortunate that some of these things have gone on to have fairly long histories like Task Manager and Pinball hasn't been in the product, but everybody still remembers it and knows it and remembers the sound effects and the music. And so it's been, it's been really nice to work on stuff that people at least can recognize. So if I was working on missile guidance or something, it would be much harder to explain what you do all day than to say, well, yeah, task manager, I wrote that, or pinball, you've played that, I worked on that, that kind of thing. So it's nice to have a few common touch points because 
a lot of the stuff I did write was, you know, doing ref counts down in the calm plumbing and stuff like that that you don't see. So I mean, I just while you're talking about this, I thought about you did start the start menu as well. You were you were heavily involved in, in the in, in the start menu and NT as well. Yeah, right? that was part of the shell that we were porting. And one of the first challenges we faced with it was that it said Windows 95 on the side banner of the start menu. And that was because Windows can't draw text sideways. They actually had to create a graphic in Photoshop or Paint Shop or whatever they were using and then rotate it and they would blit it onto the screen as a graphic. Well, there were two problems, the biggest of which was we had to ship Windows NT workstation, server, advanced server, and then there were 64-bit and 32-bit variants, and they would all say something slightly different on the start menu. So now you've got at least six different bitmaps per language, and now you've got maybe 12 languages, 72 bitmaps. It gets pretty unwieldy pretty quickly. So I decided, yeah. well, let's see if we can rotate the whole thing. And I used the NT drawing calls to rotate a device context and then render Windows NT in the correct font up the side and draw the gradient behind it. And all that's done live as opposed to Win95 where it was just a uh, snapshot. But it allows you to have it say or do whatever you want. Amazing. So it's like Task Manager is like the one that I think a lot of people would recognize because it's software that we've all Oh, well, I think anyone who's really used Windows, as, as, unless it's perhaps my mother or someone who's not really technical, uh, has used and found really, really useful. Uh, but you've also done like other stuff, like the um, the zip thing is, is people just use it today without even thinking about it. But I think you were also involved in calculator and clock. Is that right? I owned calculator for a while, and that's when we did the switch to infinite precision math. So we purchased or licensed a library that instead of just using IEEE floating point in the actual calculations, you could have infinite precision math. And it's a lot of pressure. You don't want to be the guy that broke calc and had calculator give the wrong answer because you can imagine the press would just, it was bad enough with a Pentium bug yep. in the day. So if you had calculator giving the wrong answer, it was a lot of pressure to make sure all the answers still came out right, let's say that. I never, never actually worked on the clock, but the NT clock was unique in that it was a circle and you could double click on any of the dead space and it would remove the frame and give you this little floating widget that you could drag around the desktop. So I thought, well, what a great idea. I'll do that in Task Manager. And if you double click any dead space in Task Manager, <laughs> it removes all the UI and you just get the graphs. My intent was now you can park that little graph up in the corner of your screen and have a CPU graph. But I think 90% of the people that ever accidentally did that were suddenly confused yeah. by where did my Task Manager go and what is this and how do I fix it? So I think yeah. it's still in there, but uh, not the best feature I ever added. Yeah, but I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to talk to someone like you who He's touched millions of lives with the code that you've written and to hear the stories and hear that. I think it's a huge inspiration for a lot of people that a lot of the stuff you did on the side and then it, it was something useful and either Microsoft bought it or it just made its way into, into the windows that we know today. Yeah, I seem to have a good knack for knowing what it was that I thought was missing and that I could go and patch a hole in the system and say, this is an area where I wish it had this functionality. I'll just go home and write it. And then that doesn't no, I mean, I've got a source folder on my machine with 200, 300 projects that never went anywhere as well. But obviously there are some that have gained traction. And so I'm very lucky in that regard. Now, I love that. I think it's an inspiration for anyone. I mean, I've written some code, nowhere near obviously what you've done, but I, I've written some code that was useful for me and then it became useful for other people. Yeah, I think this might sound a little grandiose, but one of the things that's cool to me is because I have an intimate knowledge of how the machinery of Task Manager works, how the message pumps works, and how the pages are laid out, and what the code does. And I know that there are at any point up to a billion of them out there installed and in use. So I know that in my head, I've got this little machine I built, and now there's a billion copies of it out there all running the same way. And that feels really cool. And it's not a popularity thing. It's a, I made a machine, and now there's a whole bunch of these machines doing lots of work around the world. For some reason, that's fascinating to me. I think it's amazing. It, it, I mean, it's the same on YouTube. Like you, the video that, that you did on Task Manager, when I look today, is like 1.2 million views. That's um, over a million people have watched your story about Task Manager. It, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a lot of Carnegie Halls if you fill them up one at a time, but it's, it depends how you think about it, I guess. So I want to ask you about this. You mentioned it right in the beginning, blue screen of death. Um, why is it blue? And is it possible to change the color? It is possible to change the color. There are red screens of death and green screens of death. The reason it is blue... I don't want to really give away the entire thing. I'll tell you the reasons why it's not blue. My assumption was that when we would have labs in the machine, they'd all be black text or white backgrounds, depending if they were in text mode or in Windows mode. And so if you walked into a lab of 50 PCs and one of them was crashed, well, the fact that it's the one with the big blue screen makes it really obvious. And so I think somebody had told me that, and I always assumed that was true. But I know the guy who wrote the original crash dump code, uh, John Vert, and I, I worked with him at 
windows. And so I tracked him down and I kind of do the detective work of how did it get to be blue? Why is it blue? And the answers are non-obvious, but it's one of those things that somebody made a decision, you know, 30 years ago. And then somebody said, well, I'll do the same as that guy. And the next guy said, I'll do the same as that guy. And it became a tradition, basically. And I kind of followed that trail back. Just for everyone who's watching, Dave explains it in a lot of detail. I'll link that video t- uh, below, and as well as a lot of the other videos that we've mentioned. Dave, ChatGPT has taken the world by storm. What do you? What's your thoughts about ChatGPT? I know you've done a video on it as well, which I'll link below. Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, wh- what's your thoughts on ChatGPT? I think it's transformational for programs because pretty soon you won't be able to program without ideally having it look over your shoulder or tell you where to start. Because so much of when you're writing code is you could write that from scratch. Ideally, you would take it from a library. But if you had something you had to write from scratch, I think starting with a chat GPT framework and asking it to give me the rough code and then fill it out from there is a lot more productive than writing all the boilerplate yourself. So for boilerplate stuff, chat GPT is great. And then once you've got your code already figured out and working, or not working in this case, perhaps, uh, you can find, feed your code back into chat GPT and say, where's my bug? And quite often, it can spot the fault in your logic or in your implementation. And uh, it really shortcuts some of the development process that I think everybody's going to need to know and use it. It's not that programmers are going to be extinct and you're just going to ask ChatGPT to write an app because it's the complexity and the interaction and the synchronization between parts of code. That that's where you make your money as a programmer. It's not writing hello world. So it can do the easy work while you're doing the fun and cool stuff, I think. Yeah, I love that because I mean, that's the concern. People are saying that ChatGPT is going to replace all of us and uh, developers are going to be replaced or coders are going to be replaced with ChatGPT, but you don't think that's going to no, happen? No, I think right? uh, GPS will have a huge impact on London tax- taxi drivers, but it's not going to replace the taxi or obviate the taxi, they'll still need good drivers. And I love that because it's a, it's an encouragement for everyone who's, for the young people starting, because I get this question a lot, like, should I get into cybersecurity? Should I get into dev? Because I mean, there's going to be no jobs, but it's good to hear that you, you see it as, a, as an enabler or a tool rather than a replacement for Absolutely. For I would say if you were doing a job that can be replaced by chat GPT at this point, you were probably doing a job that you don't want to do for the rest of your life anyway, because it was probably a little mundane and predictable. The real cutting edge stuff is not coming out of chat GPT, so... And I mean, the other issue a lot of people have raised with ChatGPT is the code that it creates is is bad code, as in it's got like vulnerabilities or doesn't use the you know best practices. Three five was quite bad. Four zero, I'm actually fairly impressed with with how it can do it, but I still do get things where I look at the code and I'm like, wait a minute, and then I ask it, "Are you sure you meant this? Because this can only hold eight bits." And it goes, "Oh yeah, I forgot about that." And then it goes back and fixes it, which is a little frustrating. Why didn't you do that without me asking? But uh, <laughs> Hopefully they will improve that to the point where you don't have to uh, interrogate it quite as hard. It's been fascinating to you know go through your videos on your channel. What's your plans with your channel? Uh, what what do you what kind of content are we going to be seeing you know coming to the channel? I think a lot of the same focus on Microsoft history. There's only so much stuff that I touch, so only so many stories to tell. But occasionally I think of a new one and throw it out there as a new episode. Uh, a lot of programming topics, and we're doing a lot of addressable LED and matrix LED coding. Uh, we've got a mesmerizer project that is a desktop display that does audio. Graphs, it's a fireplace, it's a stock ticker, it does sports scores, that kind of thing. Um, so we've been having a lot of fun with that, and that's an open source project that people have been contributing to since I did a video on that about a month ago. So Dave, your channel is amazing. I've spent a lot of today, like I said, watching it, and I have seen a bunch of your videos in the past. I highly recommend that all of you who are watching go and subscribe to Dave's uh, channel. You can learn so much, and it's not just history; it's also about coding best practices, a whole bunch of stuff that that you can go and learn. But Dave, what it, apart from your YouTube channel, do you can you share any things that you're going to be doing? And I believe you're going to a conference or you're doing something. Any other like places people can perhaps meet you or you know? Yeah, I'll be you. at VCF West in Mountain View. I believe it's August fourth and fifth. I'll be speaking there, and I'll be on the speakers panel as well with Adrian Black and a few other people. So that should be an interesting time. I encourage anybody in the area to come check it out. Say hello. That's brilliant, Dave. Thanks so much for sharing, you know, your your knowledge and experience, especially the, the thing about ChatGPT and, you know, AI replacing developers and like encouraging people who are, you know, who are, who are starting their careers. I mean, I mean, it's amazing to be able to talk to you. I A lot of us have used the products that you've created. Um, so thanks so much for creating those things, even, you know, doing it as a side project and then suddenly became something useful in the Windows kernel or, you know, the Windows operating system. Great talking to well, you. Thanks, thanks for so much me. for Have sharing. a great day.